Because you know what I don't want to do with that one, no. Mm. What's going on with that one? Waka. And that's the only Alaska, the only Alaska greeting I know. <laughs> um, that now, uh, we've got to know that he's with the Wadi Ningoriza, Scott now, either way, either way again, I got a Wadi Ia Guatarha Sene, to Neo Tia, a Yeti Adit Nyon Dunstan, and Uncock Nanyon de Wien Stanis. I'm grateful that you've decided to come here and hear me talk about how we test people for how well they speak, right? Um, oh, I don't have a clicker. I gotta. So, for those who haven't seen this slide, I said I'm from Six Nations. That's the English name for our community, Oswego, is the Ganyongkeha name. And that's on the Canadian side of the border, halfway between Detroit and Buffalo, which is there. And uh, our communities. Six nations, and from, that's where the name comes from. Three languages still spoken. Uh, we've got 13,000 people living on a reserve, and another 13,000 people that live off reserve. Uh, so don't ask me if you know somebody. If I know somebody from Six Nations, chances are not, except Jeremy. <laughs> he lives right, a pretty big reserve, a pretty big reserve, and uh, he lives right behind the hill behind my house. We've got only two first language speakers left. In our community. There's 2,000 that live in other Mohawk communities. So we've got people we can call on for help, but um, they're a long way away. And uh, we began our, our program, Teaching Adults, 1999. And that was uh, something that my wife and I uh, began at that time to teach the language. And I'm going to so explain Part of this session is assessments and goal setting. And part of it is to talk about how somebody might, or how we started our group, to perhaps give you some ideas of how uh, somebody might start a, an adult group in another place. Um, perhaps, man, on yo. Yeah, dege, lea, gaxene. So we offer a, oh, ooh, close call. Yeah, well. uh, we offer an adult immersion program. It's two years long. We have an online program. We have a, a YouTube channel with a lot of instructional videos, uh, before and after videos. And we have a website that hasn't been updated in two, maybe three years. So don't go there looking for current information. And it hasn't been updated in two or three years because we're really short staffed. There's only three and a half staff. So I teach a second year program. A colleague uh, teaches the first year. We've got a TA that works with him. And our online programmer works half, a year, half time. So we, we don't have a big staff to do stuff like website updating. Uh, the, the past two days, I've talked about those first three matters. And uh, the other thing that is left over is assessments and goals. And uh, from what we do here, this is a critical part of, of um, our program here. And uh, the reason being is that, please come sit. You get a front row seat. Um, we were in operation for many years, well, maybe five, well, from the very start, um, we began a program, my wife and I, to become speakers of the language. Uh, we, neither one of us spoke the language, our parents didn't speak the language, and uh, one, uh, a lot of things happened and finally things came together to allow us to, uh, to bring students and uh, speakers and a program uh, together in one place and funding. So we got it up and off the ground and we started working in that way and uh, we were in business for a couple of years and I have this idea of fluency started eating at me. Uh, we, we, be, we operated that first year and uh, at the end of the year it sort of worked for me. I was, I was not a speaker at the beginning. I sort of had some a little smattering of the language I sort of picked up in recent years. 
And I was a sort of a pretty good beginning speaker at that end of the first year. And uh, it was something that my wife and I had done just uh, for our benefit. And at the end of the year, people came up to me and said, I want to take the program in September. We go, uh, well, uh, there is no program. You know, this, this isn't a school. We didn't set up a school. Well, I want to take it too. You're, you're, you're a good speaker now, and I want to do it now. Well, OK. So we found the funding and found the stuff to do it again and again. And here we are 19 years later. Um, after several years, this idea of fluency sort of bugging me, bugged me, bugged me, bugged me. And uh, I kept, I kept um, trying to find a definition of fluency. Because uh, that was the term that was used in those days was fluency. And um, I looked up and found definitions of it. And it, I'm thinking, this is not a help to me. I wanted to be able to show to people who were, I was asking money from to say, hey, here we are in terms of achievements, in terms of fluency. And um, these definitions that you can find on, in those days, it wasn't a web or a, a Google to look in. Um, but I said, this is what we got. And we couldn't really, um, couldn't really sort of justify or pinpoint where we're at. And uh, then this issue of um, assessments came up. And I would go to conferences, maybe not, not as big as this one, but language conferences, native language conferences that were built, being held across the US and Canada. And people would get up and talk about their program and how wonderful it was and how great things were. And I would ask them, well, like, how well do your students speak? And they go, oh, they're, we, we teach this and that and this and that and this and that and this and that. And yeah, they, they know all of this stuff. Okay, well, like, like, how good a speaker are they? And, uh, and they were kind of evasive, and I'd, I'd try to pin them down. I said, well, like, do you test how well they speak? I don't know how you would do that. But he'd... And it got, some of them kind of got kind of riled, and people said in these words, that's not our way. We, we Ongohongwe people, we don't do that. We don't classify and categorize people. Now, that's... That's white man's BS. I go, OK. Um, and then I stumbled on this outfit, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, which everybody refers to as ACTIVIL. How many people have heard of this outfit? Half of you. OK. Um, so I find out that they have a, uh, uh, a technique, a process, that wasn't me, was it? Uh, of assessing proficiency. They don't use the word fluency. Fluency refers, is, is related to the word fluid. So water flows, it's fluid, and there's different rates at which water flows. Uh, so there's different degrees of fluency, but trying to pull out or define what, what is more fluid than another is kind of um, hard to do. The, uh, <clears throat> the Actifold group has come up with this method of assessing proficiency, how well somebody speaks according to their scale. And I find that this is an extremely valuable tool, not just for seeing how well one student uh, does and another student does, but when one, we have a program like ours, where we've got two, uh, two classes, it allows us to see how well this class is doing as opposed to how well that class is doing, how well this year's class did compared to last year's class. And at the same time, of course, it allows you to assess instructors. Well, if your class reached this level and this other instructor's level class reached this level, maybe this person's a better instructor, maybe. It allows us, we have three languages sp spoken in the community. And they all, because of our insistence, they all um, use this Actifil method as a way of assessing. And so we can compare uh, our whole entire program with these other language programs that use Actifil as assessment. And this is one of the things that, is a, that should be a help to us in like 
uh, trying to get money because we're all competing for the same money from the same community. And we can demonstrate, well, our group gets this and other groups don't. And it should mean that we get money or more money. It doesn't, but that's, that's that. But I, I find it um, very valuable because uh, it got us out of the bind where we were at for years of um, being totally absorbed in teaching and not really focused on results. And uh, I discovered it after about two or three, four years of teaching and I thought, okay, this year we're gonna have like a final exam or a final year, end of the year and I'll really find out where these students are at. And at the end of the year, I sat there and came up with the idea. What I will do is I'll get photographs and uh, I'll sit down with these students at the end of the year, one-on-one, -on -one, and give them a half a dozen photographs and say, pick one, anyone. And so I gave them a photograph of Bart Simpson, of a bear, of um, some, some house in the woods, um, a kid on a bike. I said, pick one of these and tell me everything you can about it in the language. Right. Well, that'd be a good assessment. And everybody picked a bear. Almost everybody picked a bear. And I said, okay, what can you say about it? And they'd say, Ohesa. It's brown. Uh -huh. You want to tell me that it lives in the woods? <laughs> it performs natural functions in the woods, you know? It eats berries and <laughs> it eats berries and bugs. You know, it sleeps all winter long, you know, it's got long claws. That's all material that we gave them to talk about during the year, then use it. Okay, we've got a problem here. And it was at the, basically at the same time that I stumbled onto Actifil, which is uh, a method of assessing how well people speak and allowed me to focus not on teaching, but on results. But having that in, in mind, that we want people to be speaking at a, at, at a particular level, allowed us to focus all of our, our um, instruction throughout the year on results and not the activity of what we were doing. So I found that that was a big help in, in just motor, not messing motor, but directing us and how we did towards the end result, which is people speaking uh, as well as we wanted them to. So their, their system, they, whoop, there's a C missing there. Um, they have, 11 levels. There's the novice, intermediate, advanced, superior, and distinguished levels. Um, and I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about these because some of you are familiar with them. I simplify it by saying that a, a novice level speaker is somebody who speaks in memorized words and phrases. They cannot create language. They cannot sustain a conversation. Uh, they may sound very good and fluent because they've got memorized phrases. And people who saw that, that uh, before and after video that I showed the other day of that young man, he was able to spit out a pile of information there and he sounded great. Terrific accent, it was perfect. Uh, he didn't understand those questions when I put them to him. You know, so it was, he, was not a, he was a novice level at the very bottom, novice low when he started. Um, and so people, that's how we all begin. We memorize greetings, we memorize, you know, how to say your name, we memorize maybe things about the weather, who knows, things like that. Not much, we can count to 10, we can know a few colors and animal names, and that's about it, okay? And this, the next level up is an intermediate level speaker. Somebody who can speak in complete sentences, they can create language, they can sustain simple basic conversations on personal matters. And an example of an intermediate level speaker is somebody who will say, I got up at eight o'clock, uh, I showered, I ate breakfast, I went to work, I came home, uh, I ate dinner, I watched TV, I went to bed. That's an intermediate level speaker, okay? They can put a sentence together, they can probably string them together like that, okay? Um, they're talking about themselves, they may be able to, um, to create, they may be able to create language. They can think about, oh, uh, 
Um, like an English speaker, um, uh, they can, uh, beginning children growing up will figure out and hear the language and they'll figure out how to say something without being taught. Uh, in English, we have this little thing at the beginning of word, R-E, to do something again, right? to do and to redo, write and rewrite. They know when they put that re at the beginning of a word that it's talking about doing it over. They learn that by hearing it. And so they're creating language in their head. Right? Um, and they do that in English. We do that in our languages as well. We hear and we figure out how the language works and we're able to create a new word that they've never said before without being taught the word. Okay? And that's what an intermediate level speaker can do. They can figure out how to say things. And in our program one year early in the in the, in the going, we were, um, um, and it's, it, you see that we're, we're based on the root word method, meaning that we teach people how to think in a language. We don't force them to remember what, what uh, whole words or phrases. I was sitting at lunch, and one of the students at the far end of the table says, And he said, pass the, they knew the command for passing, whatever, pass the salt. And he says, Whoa. What he said was, pass the little pieces of meat. We're having soup and salad. I'm going, look. I'm going, what? And I'm thinking, I never taught him that word. He didn't, he's got nobody in his family that could teach him that word. I look and there's a little jar of bacon bits on the table in front of me. He'd made that up by how the language works. I understood it perfectly because he put it together correctly. I understood it perfectly. I'd never heard that word myself. Uh, he just made that up and it was a perfectly good word for bacon bits and now that's, that's what I use now. You know, and that's an example of an intermediate level speaker, somebody who can create from what they've heard. And uh, hearing somebody do that, they're going, okay, what we're doing here is gonna work in terms of enabling people to become speakers. Right? So that's, that's a no, an intermediate level speaker. And an advanced level speaker speaks in paragraphs of interconnected discourse. That's an actifil term, okay? It's not mine. But what that means is that that little story about getting up at 8 o'clock, going to work, coming home, cooking, watching TV, and going to bed. An advanced level speaker would say, I got up at 8 o'clock this morning but I should have got up at seven because my boss said that if I came in late one more time, he's gonna fire me and I really need this job because I got bills to pay. That's an advanced level speaker, okay? He's not just stringing together sentences. He is putting them into a bigger context and explaining one thing after another. He's explaining cause and effect. Okay? So that is an advanced level speaker. And of course they have, um, grades within those ranges. There's a high level, a mid-level, and a low level of those things. And uh, it also explains they can make an argument and defend an opinion. They sustain in-depth conversations. And they have full control over grammar. They rarely make grammatical mistakes. Okay? So that's what an advanced level speaker uh, can do. Um, an active classifies languages by how long it takes to learn them, uh, at least when they're talking about the standard uh, English ones. Group one of the languages that are grammatically closest to English, like French, Spanish, Italian, and a highly motivated adult student can become an advanced level French speaker after about 600 hours. 600 hours in a classroom, you're a fluent, a proficient, an advanced level French, Spanish, Italian speaker. And so you figure that by university classes, how many, year, how many hours in a class are you per year? I don't know, what's that, 80? Is that about right? Depends how many you do. Yeah, how many courses you take out. Uh, so that's the amount of effort that has to go in to get to be an advanced level French, Spanish, Italian speaker, where you can talk all, you can say, I got up at eight o'clock, I should have got up at seven because my boss said if I get in there late one more day, he'd fire me in French, Spanish, Italian, if you've got 600 hours. Um, well, I think there might be a slide missing here. No. 
Okay, I think there's a slide missing. Yeah, here we go. This slide's in here to say that it's out of, out of order, but I want to, uh, to let you know that Actifil has an annual convention. This year it's in New Orleans, and uh, I'd encourage you, if you work at a place that's got a travel budget and a, and a uh, professional advancement budget, to go there. These are, these are teaching professionals who teach second language. They teach French and Spanish and Italian and Chinese and Russian and Japanese. And uh, there is generally about, I've been to two of them now, and there are between four and 5,000 people that attend. They're monster conventions to go to. The catalog, the agenda is this thick. It took me an hour to skim through it. Now it's online, it's easier to find what you're looking for. And uh, even though I'm teaching a language and there's 5,000 people and I'm the only Mohawk person in the, in the whole building, I found a ton of things that I found helpful. Uh, you can go into, they have dozens and dozens of sessions from people who teach all kinds of languages and they're there to share tips, techniques, strategies, methods. And you go there and you can learn a lot just by sitting and listening to people have uh, demonstrate their things. And they've got slides and videos showing how they do things and I found it terrifically um, helpful. Um, they have a, um, an exhibition floor where people are, they've got things to sell for all different languages. You can wander through that thing there and you take a look at stuff and they, people have got board games and other activities that are going on uh, that they're selling and, and teaching um, apps and whatnot. And I go through and I go, ooh, there's something I could use, and I just translate that into Mohawk. You know, you can see a ton of ideas there that are very useful. Uh, and um, it's also as well uh, good to go there, and uh, I find that, I f that some of the ideas of what I have about teaching, I find reinforced there. And I hear experts who've got PhDs talking about the same things that I do, and I go, oh, I guess I am right, you know, I've got proof. Uh, so I find it terrifically um, helpful to go there, and if you have a chance, try to get there. Okay. I'm... Here we go. This is back in order a little bit. So this is from the Actifil website, showing how long it'll take for these languages. So we've got here... These are the group one languages that are so-called easy to learn. And uh, 700 hours, you can get to an advanced high level for any one of these languages uh, if you've got an average aptitude, that's it. Okay. Group twos, a little more foreign, and it takes twi almost twice as long to get that far because these languages are... Um, much more um, further related than English. German's somewhat related, uh, but the rest, not a bit. And they're not that grammatically complex. Then there's a third and a fourth level. And here we go, and here you can recognize some of those things. Russian is one of them. And here we go to get to advanced high. This is not right. I think, oh, it's the previous one. The German level is about 900 to 1,000 hours, as I remember. And here, this thing I've seen is up to 1,500 hours for Russian. And then group four, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. They're saying that this is 24, 2,500 hours and to get to advanced, uh, advanced high. So 2,500 hours. Our program is 2,000 hours. And we do not uh, graduate students at that level. We have maybe one out of the years. 30 hours a week? Can I do math on that? 30 hours a week? How many, how many weeks is that? Well, I mean, it's the same. That they're, they're doing 30 hours every week. If they're going to hit those levels, then that's how, that's how they're calculating. 
Yeah. Um, these things, these things come. These figures uh, come from the American Foreign Service Institute that that teaches uh, American diplomats to go work in foreign countries, and they say that a highly motivated student will achieve these things here. And what they mean by that is that they lose their job if they don't succeed at this. So that's a pretty good motivation for somebody with a mortgage and a family. Good motivation. Uh, and half of these hours that you see here, half of these hours are spent in Saudi Arabia, in China, in Japan, Korea. Half of those hours. So we are, don't have anything like that uh, system. It will take us longer to get there. And our language, this is, this is much, these languages, of course, are completely foreign to English, just as ours are. There are no Ongohoi languages on this chart. But in terms of complexity, and you saw uh, how I was demonstrating how complex Mohawk is, uh, remember that word? What's that mean? Anybody? I will go buy flowers for her again. Okay, one word. Um, I think that our languages are at that level of complexity and would require that many number of hours to get to a high level. But, um, what the heck? And one thing here is that Actifil has, system has 11 levels. And so I say it's much more precise and it's much more useful than the European framework because the European framework has five. I think that there's just A1, A2, B1, B2, C. Yeah. That's just five levels. So B1 covers a huge territory. Uh, when you say that, when you say that in the Actifil system that you're an intermediate low, I know just exactly what you can do. Uh, and anybody that is familiar with the Actifil system knows exactly what you can do what your limitations are, what you can do uh, with any of the active field levels. We've got a really close idea. The, uh, this European model is very broad. It could be a huge variation between just when you say you're a B1. Mm. So I, I, we are really pushing that in, uh, in our communities. We've got the other programs in our community, all of the Mohawk programs, uh, you follow that model. And so we're slowly adopting that as a standard. Okay. Um, now I want to. So I um, don't know. And uh, has anybody seen one of these or gone through one of these uh, interviews? They do this by interview form. They want a couple of people, three people. This is where uh, Actifil will. Um, train you to conduct their assessments. Okay, you can go to one of their sessions. If you go to their convention, they have a room to the side. You can sign up and take that, that program. And they have, uh, if you want to know about it, they have a one-day session, a two-day session, and a four-day session. And uh, I've been to three of them. I've been to the first, the one-day, the two-day, and the four-day. And um, they will also send somebody to your community. And that's what we've done a couple of times. We just hired somebody to come, and they explain the whole thing, they show the videos, they walk you through the whole system, uh, they, they get you to try it. Okay? And uh, I find that to be the, the, the best in terms of giving a, a, no, a number of people in your community a chance to see how it works. The price is very reasonable. Um, they're professionals and are doing a, a very precise job, but they don't charge a fortune for it. It's, I think it's maybe six hundred or a thousand dollars for the, the instructor's fee plus their travel. So it's not a huge amount of money for professional development for somebody who's operating a language program with a couple of classes. You know, um, so that, I'd encourage people to think of, think about that in terms of. Um, 
opening people's minds as to how you can figure out how well somebody speaks and uh, start getting a grip on how to fill the holes in somebody's language. Because we all have a, an idea about how well uh, people speak the language, but this really will help pin it down some. This is, um, they do this by way of what they call an OPI, Oral Proficiency Interview. These things are about 20 minutes long, 20, 25 minutes long. The interviewer will, uh, and the, and the uh, uh, person being assessed will sit down together and they go through this interview. The Actifil, when you go to these workshops, will teach you how to do it. So they'll get you to uh, uh, get that person comfortable, settled, and sort of reduce the stress as much as you can. And you walk them through. You begin by asking them, so, how are you? Hello. And um, uh, can we start by saying, uh, maybe can, you can explain maybe just a little bit about yourself. And you're going to say, oh, um, what might you say? My name is Nick. Huh? My name is Nick. Name? Great. Oh, that's great. And, and uh, where do you live? I live in Cake. Pardon? I live in Cake. Cake. And, um, and who do you live with? My husband. Okay. Um, uh, so this is just uh, getting them to provide information. Generally, eventually they'll, they'll produce something that can lead you to ask another question about them. So you're not testing them on things they might have learned in school or required to know in their job. You're just asking them about them, stuff that they can provide information about. Um, and their, their, their method is to not try to stress the person out. Um, and so they, they will ask basically, where do you live and who do you live with? And um, um, uh, can you tell me about the place that you live? Is, is it an apartment? Is it a, is it a house? And then they, that questionnaire, do you live in an apartment or do you live in a house? I live in a house. In a house, okay. That's the kind of a question they'll ask. What you've just asked a, that person is a question where they've given them a choice, this or that. They have to recognize that as a question, one or the other. And so they're going to have to answer one or the other instead of yes or no. And you, when you're interviewing somebody like that, you see very quickly whether they're supplying you with information in sentence form or in word form or in paragraph form. Um, if they're supplying you, we, you go in on the, on the assumption that they can supply you with sentences of information. Um, if, you are, if they're giving you just single word answers, you don't really know if they can speak in sentences or in paragraphs. Maybe they're just shy, maybe, uh, maybe they don't like the color of your shirt. Blue's good. Um, you don't know if they're intimidated. So you have to keep working at them, working at them, and try to draw them out. And you ask them easy questions until they can feel they start supplying with information. Uh, did you always used to live there? No, I used to live in Anchorage. No, I used to live in Anchorage. Okay, now we've got a sentence to work at. And uh, at some point, you start to have to start pushing them, nudging them a little bit to see what can they do with the language. Uh, and uh, you start, you, you would push them to say, uh, you could push them to say, well, why did you move to this location? That's a lot more difficult question to answer. Uh, I said, I used to live in Anchorage. An easy question would have been, how long did you live there? Two years, that's just a one word answer. But if you ask them, why did you move to the, your present location? Well, they gotta start telling sentences at this point. So you're constantly pushing them to give more elaborate answers, but you ease off on the pressure with a simple question, a yes or no question, to re reduce the pressure. So you're always nudging them, nudging them. Um, to do it. And, if they'll pr and why did you move to your present location? Oh, my husband got a job, or I went to school, or something like this. Um, and then you finally sit there and you say, well, can you tell me what the difference is of living in your present location with Anchorage? What's the difference between those two towns? Now they've really got to supply information. Well, the one town is this, the other town is this. And they've got to supply more and more information and speak in bigger and bigger. So the, the nature of these questions 
really pushes somebody to see how far they can operate consistently. So the idea of this interview is to, to define just how, at, well, at what level somebody speaks consistently. Um, and then if you really want to push them to the high level, then you say questions that sort of make them think about bigger issues besides themselves. So how could the community that you live in now be a better community? Oh, then they've got to think, what would be, hmm. Well, if our, if our community council would have a, 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 you know, a dog bylaw that would keep dogs from running around and you know, biting little kids, that would be great. But, and uh, what would be, uh, what's the holdback? What's preventing the community council from doing something like this? Your conversation is now going to an upper and upper level. And this person has got to start thinking, well, why doesn't the community council do that? Um, and at some point, people's language will stop, they'll break down, they can't, they can't function at a really high, le at, a, at a particular level. Everybody's got an upper level, and at some point that language uh, will break down, they'll, they will sort of get to their, to their um, consistent level and stay there. And so in, during the course of this interview, you're keeping track of where they're at, and you're always testing them to see if they can go higher and to make sure that the level, at the, the, the level that they seem to be at is something they can do consistently. So after the, after the interview, then you can, you, um, you re-listen to it or re-watch it if you video it, and uh, you get another person to verify it. So we get somebody else to listen or to watch that video and say, yes, that's, a, that's an intermediate low or that's an advanced high. Um, so this is how we do it, and uh, I find it very valuable to, uh, to do this, especially when we've got a two-year program. Our students want to know how well they're doing. And, uh, you know, A, B, C, D doesn't cut it. So they want to know in ways that are, uh, that are helpful, well, where, what's going on with them? If they see a, that they've got an, um, an intermediate low rating after the first year, well, it means that they're speaking at this sentence level, but they're just barely doing so. They can just barely do it. And they, they don't do it consistently. They can speak in sentences from time to time to time, but they can't do it consistently. Uh, so that's a, um, a signal to them of, of what they can do and what they can't do. And uh, when we tell them this is our program expectations for you after the second year, and here at some point, um, what, this, what this, um, this assessment scale gives us is um, a, me a way of measuring how well individuals speak, but also provides us with the uh, basis for deciding where is our program going. And that, that is back to goals. These things help us set goals for our entire program. And we have a two-year program and a, our first-year program goal. After the first year, we expect our students to be speaking at the intermediate low level to be able to attend the second-year program. Now, intermediate low is that level I just mentioned. They speak in sentences, but not all the time. And this, when I say they speak in sentences, no, that's about any ordinary everyday thing. So uh, the thing is that that's our, um, the bar they have to clear to get into second year. Most of them do better than that. Most of them speak at the intermediate mid-level. But the bare minimum is intermediate low. If they're at a novice high, we say, we invite you to take first year over again. As our whole mission is to create speakers and we're not like a university that says, well, you didn't pass, you fail. No, we, we just say, you didn't pass yet. We'll give you another chance to do it, and people will. They'll take this, the second year over, or the first year over. And second year, we expect people, by the end of the second year, to have achieved an advanced low level, meaning that they can speak in these paragraphs 
I got up at 8 o'clock. I should have got up at 7 because my boss said if I got late one more time, I get fired. They can just, just begin to start dealing at that level. And a good number, uh, most of our students do achieve that. A few get to advanced mid. And the rare person gets to advanced high. Okay, meaning that they sound pretty darn good. And we're very happy when they can get to that. Uh, because people at this advanced mid-level, for example, they have all of the language skills to go teach in any of our immersion schools all day long in the language, uh, if that's what they choose to do, if there was a job available. So they are very competent in language, and they uh, also then have the ability to go on and, and uh, deal with a uh, first language speaker um, and further in in improve their proficiency. People have seen that before and after video with Ryan DeCare talking about dog crap in a garden. That fellow finished the, our two-year program. He was an advanced, mid-advanced, high-level speaker when he finished. He then went to Gahnawage and lived with this 80-year-old lady for two years, who spoke only in Mohawk. And you should, he, he's way at the top, top level now. And he's terrific in terms of his capability with the language, just absolutely terrific. Because if he tried to do that as, as any ordinary student, he wouldn't get that far. Uh, because he had understood how the language works, and you could understand how that, the way that old lady spoke and all, he's then, all he is then doing is picking up metaphors and uh, um, vocabulary that we don't have time or can't deal with in the classroom. So he's just further in, increasing his uh, proficiency in the language. So this is, um, this is um, this, these assessments are, are hugely helpful for us because it helps define our program. And I am a believer that, that uh, with 2,000 hours to get to the advanced low level, which most of our graduates achieve, and a few higher, I believe that if we get better at how we deliver the program, we can reach that level in less time. And right now, having people uh, devote 2,000 hours or two school years to that thing is a huge commitment, and some people take three years. So we think, I think that we can get that in less time and make people more productive by putting them back in the community, putting them into the classroom and doing something else with their life instead of going to school. So I think that we can reduce that time. Um, um, now, this is where I want to sort of branch out a little bit into, um, into uh, program structure and, and beginning. Saving a dying language isn't cheap. We didn't lost? Who proofread this? <laughs> I, honest, English is my first language. <laughs> honest. <laughs> so we didn't lose a language overnight. We won't get it back every night. It'll be expensive. So I, I wanted, to, because people often ask me, well, how do you, what kind of a budget do you operate on? And I'm, I'm here to tell you so what, what it costs, okay? Um, this present fiscal year, the one that started April 1st, we still don't have our budget nailed down yet. We're still waiting to get confirmation, decisions made about funding levels, but this is what we're uh, hoping to get. Uh, $500,000, half a million dollars. That's a lot of money, but no government funding. And by the way, I've, I've got a slide here. Anybody that, that wants to save their note taking, I'll send you a copy of the whole presentation. You give me, if you email, email me, the email address is the last slide. So half a million dollars, and we don't get any government money. Uh, and out of that, we will operate our first and second year program. Our first year program, we restrict to 12 students. There's two staff to teach that program. A second year program will, is 10 students, because there's some attrition. I'm the instructor for that. 
There's an online program that will operate with just one half-time staff. Uh, a third-year planning project, that is going to be government-funded. We have an online transfer project for the online program, that's government-funded. And then we have a verb genera project with the National Research Council of Canada. That's government-funded as well. But our basic operations, a first-year program, the online program, 500K, 22 students with three and a half staff. Oh no, we're going for four and a half staff now. Uh, we got, all we have is teaching staff. There's no administrators, so I teach and I do all the administration and everything else. Okay. So I'm hoping to split my job in two. One part, one half will be just instructor, the other is all administration. If that's approved, and crossing my fingers. And um, you should understand with that staff and students are paid. Students are paid to attend our program. Because we're asking people, adults, uh, to drop whatever they're doing now and come to school. And if an adult has a family and they have financial obligations, they can't do it free, for free. Go. Is it a stipend pay or is, are they like on, on payroll? Pardon? Are they, is it a stipend pay or is it like a payroll thing? Okay, I'll explain that, uh, how people are paid. Um, and I said that we, our program is not government funded. We get our funds all from the community. And in our community, we have some differences, some, um, there's a political division in our community. We have an elected band council and a traditional chief council. Uh, they don't get along. Uh, but they have their own sources of funding. Our, our elected band council gets money from the government and uh, they use uh, the money they get from the, uh, from the uh, Ontario government and they funnel this one pile of money from gambling and casino money that they get to the language programs to pay for operations and expenses. So all of our staff salaries, the rent bill, uh, books, comes from the elected bank council. That's about half of that $500,000 comes from them. The other half is monies that are paid to students. That comes from the traditional chiefs. They get money from development companies, pipeline companies, wind farms, and uh, they, are, they are not, the traditional chiefs do not pay for the upkeep of the roads or the operation of the schools or the health department. Uh, their concerns are language and culture. So they uh, fund the students. Uh, and uh, that money comes to us, we farm it out to a bookkeeping firm and students are paid. And they are paid $10 an hour to um, attend class. They're in class for 30 hours a week, so that's a maximum of $300 a week. If they're, if they're late to school one day, they're docked, right? If they miss a day, they're docked. So it, it, uh, they have to be in class to get paid. And uh, $10 an hour in Canada is, was the minimum wage. It's been raised to 11 or something now. And uh, it just so happens that I guess the, uh, the wind farm business must be picking up because the chief's council, the traditional chiefs, are going to pay a pay raise. The students are going to get a pay raise. So now this year they'll be paid up to $350 a week, which works out to eleven seventy-five an hour. That's what our students will be getting paid now, beginning in September. So that's what students get paid. And uh, for, some, for some students who have a, a large family, that's still not enough to get by. And we've had the odd student that had to drop out because they just can't afford to do it. Uh, for a single student that's just out of high school that's still living with mom, eh, what the heck, they can buy a car with that money. You know, heck yeah, they're, they're good. So there's a variation there, but in either case, students have to be uh, supported for two years, three years, in order to get this. And so the, our community believes very strongly that, that, uh, that the language should come back, and so they're, they're committed to that. 
And in Canada, we are we are um, we have a um, um, we have a history uh, with government uh, relations where the one of the previous prime ministers, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the present prime minister's father, in 1982 said at a conference with Ongohoi leaders, all the Ongohoi leaders, he was admitting, and he said to them, if the day comes when you people no longer speak your language, he says, you are no different than we are, and therefore no more entitled to special rights privileges. So the present prime minister's father told that to our leaders 35 years ago. That thought's been in the, that thought is in the, and not in the back, but probably in the mind, in the front of the minds of many of native leaders in Canada today, as well as other things. They know that they, they should be supporting language and culture, but they've got other priorities. So they've got to, you know, they've got to get a new uh, snow plow. They've got to do this and that. They, the, the, the clinic, the nurses at the clinic need a pay raise. They've got all of these other priorities. But now they're, they're getting pressure from the people to support language and culture, but at the back of their mind is that thought, you know, we're going to lose everything if we don't keep the language. So that's one of the little imperatives that's at work there. So in order for us to do this, students have to be supported. And it just shows the, the, the amount of, uh, of um, effort that has to go into putting a community program together. You know, so we're, and of course, we're just one program. We've got two other langu sister languages in our community. So there's a lot of money going into language in our community, and fortunately, in our case, we got results to show. You know, when, uh, when we started the program 20 years ago, there were only about 30 or 40 speakers left, and they were all elderly. They didn't go out. They lived by themselves. They didn't have anybody to talk to. The language, like, was invisible. We had dozens of first language speakers around, but the language was invisible because they didn't go out. Uh, they just used English with their family, with their neighbors, and it was the language was like almost non-existent. But now there's all these young people now, dozens and dozens of young people now that are out there using it in cafes. If there's any public event, somebody's on their feet uh, yapping away in the language. They're using it all over Facebook and, and uh, on, on signage. It's much stronger, much more visible, and uh, people are very much and a lot happier. Now that we got institutions, the banks are now putting up signage on their own. Hey, we want, they're wearing t-shirts with messages on the language, with, in the language on them. That kind of stuff never happened before. Now we got road signs going up. It's stuff that the community is doing in response to the fact that all these young people are now using the language. So that's his, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, uh, the kind of um, level of commitment that somebody has to make in order to do that. And I wanted to share uh, with you some, some opinions and advice about how you might do this because the institutions that are at work in most of our communities now are not set up to do what we do. We are, we are not affiliated with a university. We're not affiliated with, a, with the elected band council. We are an independent group. And being an independent group means that we do what we want to do. If we were affiliated with a university, they have their own rules and policies and procedures and priorities, and creating fully fluent speakers is not one of them. They like the idea, but that means that they're going to have to make too many adjustments. Are they going to have support a student for 2,000 hours? No, they're not going to completely overhaul their programs to, to do that within their walls. So for people who are thinking about doing what we do, I wanted to, to pass along the thoughts that this is something that, that you might, be, uh, uh, might think about doing on your own, not trying to do it within a school system, not trying, not trying to do it within a, a band council office. Maybe you can do it there. Um, <clears throat> It, it, I, could see, I see the day coming when 
when our band, elected band council might want to take it over and say, well, you guys are now band employees and this will become a band operation. It could happen, I don't, but not yet. Um, so I see that, it, that people who want to do what we do, um, I think you'd be well advised at this stage to do it on your own, but be mindful that, that there, because there are other people working in that field already, people already have interest in, that, in, in these matters, they have opinions, and you could face resistance. And that means people who want to do that have got to have a very thick skin, especially if they're not first language speakers. Now, me, our situation, we just evolved. I didn't say, we're starting a school and we're going to be in business 20 years from now. You know, that was, like, that's not how we began. And it just sort of evolved and grew and grew and grew. Well, we had a lot of resistance along the way. And if we'd tried to start out from scratch, there would have been people um, going up against us because we're competing for the, same, for the same monies. And how we got by in those, in those early days, before we were supported by our chiefs, was that we went to a job training agency in our community. We have a, in Canada, there are, there are government programs that assist native groups in terms of employment creation and, and employment training. Um, we went to this agency in, located in our community and uh, young people who wanted to become welders or hairdressers will go there and say, I want to be a welder, a hairdresser. And they say, great, go to that school in town. And this agency pays that school in town so many dollars per student per day to go there. They also use government funding to, pen, to, to, to pay that student so many dollars per week to go to school. So we just set ourselves up as that school. We were not in town, we were on the reserve. And we charged that agency so many dollars per student per day. And our students were paid through them to attend. And that was a job training. And I'm sure that the agency in our community was uh, breaking the rules to do so because it was job training. And they got, they got um, feedback that said, those guys are teaching language, that's not job training. You guys, you, shouldn't be, you can't be doing that. And our agency said, no, they're trained to be teachers, but they gotta learn the language first. They just made that up. But it, of course, it, it worked out that, that now, all of the, most of the teachers in our community have gone through our program. So now we've got 25 people teaching the language from preschool to university. So it worked out that way, and even it wasn't planned. So that was one route that we took um, to allow us to get up and operate without getting uh, the support of our chiefs. And of course, once we started getting results and people saw that this was creating speakers, then they jumped on board. So that's what allowed us to start. And um, uh, I wanted to... Oh, Oh, there's that last one. That's the email, excuse me, that's the email address if you want to get a copy of this or one of the other presentations I made, send that to me and I'll, I'll send you the link where you can download those things. And uh, I know I saw one hand up earlier. Did you have a question earlier? I'd... Yeah, I was just, you were, you were doing all the transformations in, in your language. Pardon? Yes, this interview, this interview to assess efficiency, that's all in the language. So I said, and I said, hey, how's it going? Hi, how are you doing? Can you tell me something about yourself? Maybe I don't know. So yeah, it's all in the language. And what we do is we, we this Actifil, they have got this, it's all in English. Uh, and we just say, the ideas are good, it's all in English, but we do, the principles are the same. We want people to speak in paragraphs. We don't want them to speak in memorized words. Uh, and speaking in sentences is, is good, but it's not gonna, uh, it's, it's not gonna be uh, good enough to be able to teach an immersion program, you know, for you to go teach kindergarten kids. So we conduct the interview all in the language. 
And we, we haven't modified it at all. Uh, we just sort of say, their standards will accept. It's a good definition. So yeah, we, we use it that way. Yo. What's the uh, average number of students that you have in your adult American classes? OK, the number of students. We now going to limit uh, the first year intake to 12 students. And um, that's because, um, uh, not so much for funding, but um, because that's sort of the maximum number that I'd like to have in the classroom. If there's more than 12, um, the, the class is too big for everybody to get a chance to talk. If I'm going to sit there and ask a question, um, how much is 2 plus 2? And I go around a room like this, you've got to wait a long time before you get another chance to talk. So uh, we cut that off at 12. And one year I did try 15, and that was just too much. I said, that's too much. We have, class, we've, we have had classes with as few as four students, because before we became big, uh, people didn't know about us. They didn't think, well, that, that guy, he's not a speaker. His parents aren't speakers. You know, why am I going to send you? Why, why, not, why would I go there? So we had very small classes. And out of those 12 students who start in September, this past year, we had 12 that started in September, eight finished, and only seven passed. And seven out of those eight passed in the second year. Uh, so there will be seven people that will be starting a second year program. And that's uh, probably typical. I think the dropout this year was a little bit higher than, than usual. And another thing is that, that um, one of the things that contributes to that dropout rate is that not everybody is a good candidate to attend. And that's because it seems that because of who we are as Ungohoi people and our history, they're bringing a lot of baggage with them. So a lot of people are coming there um, that are not emotionally healthy. So they've got issues that they bring with them that prevent them from doing well. So when you sit there and say, hi, you know, how's it going? And uh, can you tell me what you did last night? And some people have a variety of, of issues that just prevent them from responding in that kind of a situation. And uh, sometimes it gets too much and they just have to drop out. We also have an upper limit. We say that people over 50, we don't ban them, but they're not they're not the first in people that we accept. And that's only because brain chemistry is not working in their favor anymore. Uh, we've had a number of older people that have attended the program, along with younger people. And I'd have an old, my favorite students are the older ones, because they're there every day, they're on time, they take excellent notes, their notebooks are works of art, they're, they're, they're underlined, they're cross-referenced, they're color-coded, beautiful. I give them a handout. They come back the next day and they say, Brian, I says, this little handout here, this word here in the middle of the page here, he says, that looks like the same word on a handout you gave us three weeks ago. And I says, but they're spelled not quite the same way. He says, what's going on here? Is that the same word or not? Not only did they study last night's handout, they went back three weeks and checked it out with some other handout. I go, what's going on here? Go, and I find out that these guys will sit in class they don't pick up things as quickly as the younger students do. The young students don't show up on time. They don't, do, they don't study at night. But they remember everything from the day before. If I tell them one thing, they can also, if I tell them one thing right now, they can use it in all kinds of other ways. They figured out instantly how to use it in all kinds of other ways. The old timer can't remember what I told him. All right, and they don't remember an hour later, and they don't remember the next day. So this person figures, oh, I've got to work harder. I'm not studying enough. And they study more and more. The next thing you know, I'm getting phone calls from the old timer's wife. Hey, you've got to stop giving my husband so much homework. <laughs> He's here three, three hours a night. He's just going to give himself a heart attack. He's all stressed out and burned out about this. I said, I don't give him any homework. We don't have any homework. And that's because 
When you have moms in the class, they have no time for homework. So there's no homework. They have a, res a responsibility to use the language. Use it everywhere, every chance they get. That's their homework. But there's no formal assignments. So this is, these people here just figure they're falling behind. They see themselves falling behind. They know they're holding the class up. They get so worked up and frustrated, they quit. themselves so much that they're always, they're never where they think they should be. You ever run into that? Yeah, people, uh, um, yeah, that's one issue. It's not a very common one. A more common one is, is people who, uh, um, uh, people who, um, maybe a related one to that, is people who won't contribute. Um, we sort of know, I know that they know it, should know it, but they won't, I'll ask a question. Hey class, well, you know, is it gonna rain this afternoon? It was raining this morning when we came in here. Is it gonna rain this afternoon? And if I ask that in the language, I know this guy here, he probably knows how to answer. I'm pretty confident. And I could call on him and say, but I've learned, because this person won't say it. He won't, he knows it, but he won't say it because He's afraid of making a mistake. So we won't say it. So he'll wait for somebody else. And if uh, that person gives the right answer, yeah, right, that's it, that's it. He knows. And that's much more common. Most people, when there's participations, they know it, but they won't say it because they're afraid of making a mistake in front of their friends. And people who won't say anything until they're absolutely 100% sure that it's right. That's a bigger problem than being overconfident. Yeah, you know? um, yeah that's, that's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's... Um, but uh, one thing I was talking about yesterday is, is attitude. The, uh, the, the attitude that people bring, you have no control over, and it's hard to judge when you're accepting applications. And... Um, I, um, I'm surprised every year when on, on the first day, I'll, I'll sit with my other staff at the end of the day and I say, who's our star? Who's gonna be the stars? And you can pick them out. And who's gonna be the duds? The non-performers. We pick them out. I never write. I'm never right sometimes, but if all of a sudden people just blossom out of nowhere. And people you've got big expectations for, big duds, don't perform. And partly as that is motivation, as I said in a session yesterday, they come in there wanting to know, wanting to learn the language, but they don't want to use the language. They want to be able to know it here, but they don't want to live with it here. So when they leave, they, they, come, to, they come to class thinking this just is a, another school program. It's school to them. So they cram for tests, they obsess over tests, they get worked up over tests, they argue about a score on a test. It's a test, just like the school that they've gone to for 15 or 20 years. Some of them show up in, with master's degrees. And so they're very student oriented. Uh, but at the end of the day, go home, out the door, they don't use the language or think about the language till the next day. So when they leave the program or leave the end and leave on a Friday, there's no more language use. And six months down the road, they've forgotten most of what they learned. And then there are other people who don't do well on the tests, who uh, make gross mistakes in pronunciation. I mean, my ears bleed when I talk to some of these people. They're just awful but they got this, this burning impulse to speak the language, to speak. And they, they murder the language, but they won't stop using it. And uh, they see me on the street, oh, okay, I got to talk, I can use the language. Because they just talk to their dog, they got nobody else to talk to. Zoom right in on me, you know, and oh no, I know what I'm in for. 
And this is people who have gone 10 years ago. They still are murdering the language. They're not any better, but they still use it. That's the attitude that you want people to have. And they're putting that stuff on Facebook and whatnot and texting, and it's just full of errors. But they're communicating. In spite of the errors, they're communicating. You know what they're trying to say. So you respond and you try to demonstrate the proper language and whatnot and encourage them and go on. But those people, unfortunately, don't outnumber those people that want to know the language but not necessarily live it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, we try to say, well, now you've, 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 uh, you're entering into another universe. There's a universe that exists, a Mohawk-speaking universe that exists. All you have to do is go through the door. There's an English, uni English universe. You live in it now. You just have to go through the door. That means that you now have to start dealing with people who use the language that you probably know but you're not friends with. Well, make friends. Start doing something with them. Start using, going, going to these language groups online. Uh, start doing, using the language and draw people, those people into your world. Draw people from the English world into your Mohawk world. But lots of people don't want to do that. And I try to, uh, I try to point out to people who are, who are funding us and uh, that this is not just English and Mohawk and there's you know, two words for the same thing. It's completely different worlds. And um, um, I'm going to tell one story now in a few minutes we got left that sort of demonstrates that it's more than just vocabulary. It's just a, there's this universe that, that is available to us, um, which is based on our history and traditions, our culture, uh, that's expressed in our language, but it's not just words. And in the Mohawk people, we have, we have three overriding principles that guide, we use to guide our lives. And you can learn about them in, in English. We talk about peace, power, and righteousness. And uh, those three words would be and One of those words, I know what, when you're, growing, when you're studying a language and studying the culture, you go to indigenous studies classes, you learn these things in English, and you know what the word means, and it's translated as a good mind. And we, they use that word righteousness to say, I mean, it's not quite, it's a good mind. You should always be using a good mind. Something annoying happens, put your good mind to work and sort of get, get past that. So a good mind. Um, and um, I knew that as a, as a word, and uh, back in the, just when we first started the program, maybe the second, second year, I'd come to the program uh, in my, one of my, earlier in life, I was an activist. An activist, oh yeah. You know, a rabble rouser, you know. Sit-ins, demonstrations, all that stuff, you know, did it. So I was also involved in a local controversy in the community and I was right at the front of it, raising all kinds of heck. And I was at a public meeting. Some guy gets up and says, eh, Brian Marigold, this, da, 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 da. he was calling me down and saying what I was doing was wrong and this is correct and whatnot. And I sit there and go, uh, okay, I gotta, I gotta answer this, you know. I put up my hand to get on the speaker list, you know. And I'm sort of assembling my arguments in my head. I know I'm gonna answer this guy. And I'm sitting there waiting for my turn. And if you see those old fashioned ticker tapes, in Times Square, you see this message comes scrolling across a building like that. This word comes scrolling across my head like this. This little word comes scrolling across my head. It was gotni con rio. I knew what the word meant. A good mind. And all of a sudden, I, thought, I realized, well, if I get up and say what I want to say to answer this guy here, I'm not going to be demonstrating a good mind. And when I sit down, I'll know that I wouldn't have changed his mind. And I'll still be upset. I wouldn't have a good mind by going through this little argument, and this will just carry on this little feud. So it came to be my turn to talk. I said, no, because I wouldn't have a good mind by going through that. And so that's, at that point there, that's when I realized, huh, maybe I should start living 
this good mind and sort of not just thinking about it at this concept of what, we're at, of what we are as a people and start living these thoughts that we talk about in our language. So that's the difference between knowing the language and living the language. And hopefully that's something that, that uh, you know, we can help push others to do, live the language, not just know the language. So, etni ori i wa gadari wa kweni ji dagadari wa te denti no ni wa ge hele neni dagadari wa kashi izi seli wa ge. So that's all I have to say about explaining what I have to share with you. What's ka what's ka nuolo ji izi wese wa dehon si osto. I appreciate you you uh, paying attention to me so well. I know what's ka nuolo etu niu. Now go. Yeah.